So we're live now. Tohalapu, ima jam barbara etisa, ima yaronik halarik. Good afternoon, I'm John Barbary and I'm Tunica Biloxi and I would like to welcome you to uh, our web event, our uh, Zoom event tonight, uh, talking about uh, language reclamation and really from our perspective as a, as, a, as a group of people who've been working on that uh, and I'd like to uh, welcome all our friends and guests that have joined us tonight. Lapuyakwitiki, welcome. And uh, uh, this is something I know a lot of you uh, on this uh, on this Zoom uh, event uh, has devote your lives to uh, to language, to linguistics, uh, and we have been very privileged to have you as partners in our our quest to um, preserve and to uh, sustain the Tunica language. Uh, uh, so many projects that we've worked on together and we're very close to getting that textbook uh, completed, which we're all excited about and uh, uh, which will be a, a, a good resource for anyone who is interested in Tunica at all. I mean, even if it's just a casual interest or um, who want to devote a lot of time to it, uh, and of course, learning a second la second language is, is is a challenge, and it's something, but something that can be done. And I think it all boils down. I, I was uh, I was talking to Dave about uh, the session that we were on last night, and they were, you know, talking about how what what do you, where are you in, what what is your motivation in um, being part of a, a project to. To preserve a language, and it, it's not a just. It's, it shouldn't be just about saving the language. It should be about uh, something more, I guess, more personal. You know, uh, uh, and, and that might be, you know, uh, your identity as a, as a as a citizen of a, a Native American group uh, like ourselves, the Tunica Bluxi, and and what that means. You know, and there are deeper, deeper meanings that it's only, it, it boils down to a personal level, but it also, there's an opportunity to work together as a community to, 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 to do something that's going to be lasting and worthwhile to our two generations that are down the road. Uh, uh, I know it's, for me, uh, you know, it's been rewarding uh, in working with the team that we have here. Um, and uh, and with some of our partners out there, and I just want to say to Gosh, thank you. Um, and uh, I don't want to go on forever. I want to turn it back over to uh, I guess uh, Liz or Meg. One of you are going to be taking over, but I just want to say to Gosh, and and uh, hopefully we'll have a good discussion this evening. And I formally hand the talking stick over to you. <laughs> okay, Tikach. Anyhow, to Lapuya Akawitiki, welcome uh, to Tunica Language Work. Ask me anything. Um, I don't, as we were preparing our presentation, I don't believe we <laughs> um, made um, or included in our presentation time for us to introduce ourselves as speakers. So <laughs> I think we should get started with that first. Um, Ima, yeah. Elizabeth, uh, Pirit, Etisa. Um, Ima, Tawuruni, uh, Taluchi Yuroni, Hamatunika Language instructor, instructor, Marksville, Louisiana, Anani, here in, in Marksville. Um, and um, I've, I've been with our program since 2014, since the program began. Um, my family and I, have be, we've been working with Tulane University on behalf of the tribe since um, 2012. Um, and I'm happy to see all of you here. Um, and I'll, I'll pass it on uh, to Meg. All right, Tikash. Hini hotu, my name, Ima Meg Itisa. 
Um, I am currently, I guess you would say, maybe a linguist intern for the tribe. Um, I'm as part of my PhD work in uh, language revitalization at the University of Arizona. I've been uh, working with the LCRP on uh, the textbook and with the language classes. Uh, but before then, when I was an undergrad at Tulane in uh, I think I started in 2015 uh, as uh, working on the, uh, this project. Um, I have worked at the summer camps and I've been working on the textbook since then. So I've been around, but uh, now I'm in he I'm here as a little more specific official capacity with the LCRP. Um, Andrew, if you would like to introduce yourself, I'll pass it to you. Ima Andrew, it is Ima Ishtata Mili, Ushtata Mili, it is. I am a grad student at Tulane in the interdisciplinary uh, program in linguistics. Uh, I've been working with the uh, Tunica Biloxi tribe on, uh, on this project since January 2016. Um, and I spent uh, about a year in Marksville as the tri at tribe's uh, on-site linguist. Um, yeah. Uh, Tyler? Hey, Hotu, uh, Ima, Tyler, Etisa. My name is Tyler. Uh, Aitawahani Etisa Sahu. My other name is Aitawahani, which means firefly or AI for short. Um, I am a linguistic anthropologist and I'm from beautiful Clarksville, Tennessee. <laughs> well, I'm from Nashville, Tennessee, actually, but I'm in Clarksville, Tennessee. Um, I'm a linguistic anthropologist and a instructional designer. I worked as uh, the tribe's official linguist from the end of 2018 to the beginning of 2020. And I've been um, volunteering uh, with the Tunica Language Project since about 2015. And I think it's now on to Donna. Mm -hmm. Hini hotu, ima dana piriti tisa, ima tauroni lucironi, Marksville, Louisiana, anani. Hello, everyone. My name is Donna Pirit. I'm Tunica language teacher, and I live in Marksville, Louisiana. Hara, epa. I like to sing. Hotuti. Well, speaking of liking to sing, whenever you're ready, Miss Donna, you may begin. Oh, okay. You yo, you yo, yo 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 yo, you yo, you yo, yo 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 yo, you yo. Hey, you got in no way, huh? Hey, you got in no way, huh? Yan away, yan away, yan away, yan away, yan away. All these songs and dances, and this one is Lau Harahipu. Though it's also the daybreak dance, it means night to sing, to dance, and all are known as the Lao Hara, night to sing. It's a local pan tribal tradition shared by indigenous communities of near Marksville, Indian Creek, Kender, and Livingston, Louisiana, and Livingston, Texas. In the mid 19th century and the early 20th century, these songs have remained in oral traditions of families preservation efforts of traditionalist and the Tunica Biloxi language and culture vitalization program. In the 60s and 70s, Claude Medford, ethnologist, recorded Harry Perit and Sam Bobry, Clementine Perit Broussard and Nathan Lock Bobry singing other songs, many songs, different songs. Uh, we had uh, the Horse dance, raccoon dance, Yishihipu, Satihipu, Mishtike, and more. Harry Broussard, who is Justin's uh, relative, he would play the saxophone in his jazz sets. He would sing Lao Hara. Well, the most incredible uh, thing that happened is we saw, yes, we saw in the text there were the uh, like musical notes and sometimes the vocables for various songs along with stories. The text that Mary Haas uh, wrote 
down from her informants, the social Yushiko. And the most uh, amazing one, and the most the one we truly cherish is the Sundance song. And uh, like I said, it came when we received uh, some um, digitized information from the California archives. There it was, Hali um, and Tachi Hipu, the Sundance song. Hali chuku we, chani, chani, hali chuku we, ha. Chani, chani, hali chuku we, ha. Hali chuku we, chani, chani, hali chuku we, ha. Chani, chani, hali chuku we, ha. Ho tutti. Pikachu. Is everything sharing okay for everybody? Yeah. Hey, if I can make just a quick announcement, uh, we are giving away a, uh, some uh, door prizes. And so uh, Je Jessica has taken down uh, email addresses. So if you haven't formally registered for tonight, uh, type in your email address into the chat box and she'll she'll pick it up. Oh, Thank sweetie. you. Hey, gotcha. Okay, All right. Um, okay, everyone's uh, email addresses in chat. So um, whenever the presenter whose slide this is is ready, um, please take it away. Um, all right. So everyone who's speaking today is part of the Kukpani Yoyani Lukchi Yoroni, uh, which is, we call Kylie or the Tunica Language Working Group. Uh, and it's a collaboration between the Tunica Biloxi uh, Language and Culture Revitalization Program and uh, Tulane University. And uh, the goal is to revitalize the tribal languages of the Tunica Biloxi tribe to teach um, and to encourage uh, language use. And this workshop is designed to hopefully answer any questions you might have about uh, Tunica language revitalization, how you can get involved uh, in the work that uh, Kylie does. Next slide. So what are the sources that we have of the Tunica language and culture? Um, well, Ms. Donna alluded to one of them and it's the, you know, the more universal and usual one, which is oral tradition. Um, so the song that, the first song that Ms. Donna sang is an example of that. Um, other things that have been passed down are dances, uh, ceremonies, and words and phrases from uh, uh, languages. And oral tradition is a universal way to transmit culture and language, but it's not the only way. And um, nowadays, knowledge can also be transmitted through written documents. And, and a lot of what we know about the Tunica language uh, is due to the language that was documented in writing between 1886 and 1938. So the first time that uh, Tunica was documented in writing was in 1886 uh, when William Eli Johnson worked with uh, Swiss ethnographer Albert Gatchet. Um, and uh, so we have his field notes. So when he was talking to William Eli Johnson and writing down what he said, uh, we have that notebook. Uh, we have about 1700 vocabulary slips. So uh, just words that, that Gadget elicited from uh, William Eli Johnson and uh, comparative vocabulary. Uh, so next we skip ahead to 1907 to 1910 uh, when uh, anthropologist John Swanton worked with uh, Volson Chiki and uh, a few other uh, speakers and he, worked off of Gadget's material. So he typed up and translated uh, some of Gadget's texts. Um, he, yeah, he worked with William Eli Johnson. He worked with Volson Chiki. Uh, he worked with, um, I believe, Eli Barbary as well. Um, and 
So he published a grammar sketch, so a brief sort of description of how the language works, um, and also did some comparative work. Uh, and the third uh, linguist and informant team uh, was Sosostri Uchigant and Mary Haas from 1933 to 1938. And from this, we have 13 field notebooks, so more than 1,500 pages. So much more material uh, than the previous two. Um, she published a grammar. There's also an unpublished grammar. Uh, she published a book of texts and a dictionary um, and also wrote a sketch grammar uh, later on. And so the majority of the things that we have uh, that we know about Tunica were first um, documented uh, by Sosos Ryuchigan and Mary Haas. All right. So Andrew mentioned and Miss Donna mentioned a lot about um, how language was transmitted, right? We talked about oral knowledge and we talked about written knowledge. Um, and something else you hear a lot when uh, you're talking about uh, language use is uh, the idea of a sleeping language and a reawakening language. And I mention this because it's really crucial to this idea of knowledge transmission. So a sleeping language is a language that doesn't currently have any speakers. In a reawakening language, which is what we often call tunica, is a language that was once sleeping but is now gaining speakers. And I make this distinction um, about like how the knowledge is transmitted because you might have already heard terms like dead language or extinct language. Like when people talk about Latin, they awful, often call it a dead language. Um, but something that's dead or extinct can't come back, right? or something that's sleeping can reawaken. And using the language of like sleeping and reawakening lets you acknowledge that this knowledge transmission might have changed, but it didn't stop entirely. Um, so uh, people have been trying and continuing to share their knowledge of these languages uh, throughout, um, throughout this time, even though the normal transmission, like the, the regular transmission of the language from one generation to another uh, has been interrupted and isn't uh, proceeding in the way it normally would. Um, so across the world, many communities are very passionate about reawakening their sleeping languages. Uh, so while the specifics of these projects vary from community to community, we see a similar trend in the challenges and successes of moving from the valuable resources of written and oral tradition, like Donna and Andrew mentioned, into something that people can actually uh, learn and use in a variety of situations. Um, so here I've listed a few of the efforts uh, in North America. These are by no means all of them, not even all of them in North America, but there are a few that I thought might be interesting to our group here. So the first is the uh, Wampanoag language of the Wampanoag people in like the northeastern coast of uh, the United States. Their official program was founded in 93. Uh, there's the Miamia language of the Miami, Wea, and Illinois Confederation. So that's somewhat in Oklahoma, but also like in Ohio and Midwest area. And they've had a university tribal collaboration, kind of like Kylie, uh, since 2001. Um, and there's also been a lot of other work on it. Uh, and then the Shinnecock language of the Shinnecock people uh, in Long Island in New York, they've had immersion classes since 2017. And one thing I want to point out is next to each of these dates, I've said official program founded or uh, classes began. And that's because even though these are useful landmarks, you know, there's paperwork associated with it. So you could point to an exact date when it started happening. These are in no way the point at which people started working on their own language and sharing their language um, and teaching their language. Um, saying that, instead, this is the result of all that work, right? So saying, for example, that uh, work with language work with Shinnecock began in 2017 would be about as accurate as me coming up on an iceberg in the ocean and being like, cool, that iceberg's a foot tall, because that's all I can see poking up over the waves. It completely misses a whole uh, chunk of what's happened. So these projects are all in various stages, but they all have really cool outputs associated with them. For example, uh, the Wampanoag Reclamation Project now offers schooling in Wampanoag uh, Noak, uh, for children aged like I think kindergarten up through second grade, uh, which is huge. 
Um, and what's really essential to the success we see in these programs and uh, here with uh, the LCRP is that um, even if the very beginnings of the project involve just a few very dedicated people working directly with their resources, there began to be spaces for everyone in the com community to learn, use, and contribute to the language. Uh, a language can't thrive without speakers. Well, luckily for the languages of the Tunica Biloxi tribe, there's been support for this for a very long time. As Meg mentioned, while many revitalization programs official start dates tend to be around the 90s, um, like the ones she mentioned, likely coinciding with the Native American Languages Act of uh, 1990 and later its 1992 amendment, there has been a long history within our tribal communities to maintain our languages and cultures. In the case of our tribe, the Tunica Biloxi, Chief Joseph Alcide Perit in 1964 wrote a letter to Mary Haas requesting copies of her Tunica materials from the 30s. She stressed how he wanted, he stressed how he wanted to continue the transmission of, or the sharing um, of language and cultural knowledge to the younger Tunica Biloxi generation. During the 60s, Chief Parit con uh, contacted Vine Deloria Jr., who was the executive director of the National Congress of American Indians at the time. Uh, through Chief Parit's communication with Vine Deloria, Deloria, he learned about Haas's work and received advice from, from him, from Deloria, which uh, led our community in the direction toward beginning the process of uh, federal recognition. And um, upon learning about Haas's article, The Last, Last Words of Biloxi, published in 1968, Chief Parit requested a copy from Haas in 1970. I have his uh, a letter pictured here. Haas's article uh, details uh, Emma Jackson's knowledge of Biloxi in 1934 at the age of 87. Haas gathered a list of 54 Biloxi words from Jackson during their time together, which matched Biloxi materials from James Owen Dorsey and John Swatton dating, dating, back, to, dating back prior to 1912. So we've talked about the community sort of re-engaging with or engaging for the first time with uh, documents that, you know, describe uh, and work with their language. Um, and so how does the community now work with those same documents to create new materials that are more accessible uh, and more relevant to the community today? So one thing that's important to know is that everything that, every major thing that uh, Kylie works on has as its source, some of this documentation. So three of the major projects we've worked on are the online Tunica dictionary uh, that's on webinary, uh, the Tunica textbook that as John mentioned is hopefully gonna be done soon. Um, and the children's book in 2010 and another one that is also uh, in progress. So each of these has a source. So Webinary is based largely though not exclusively on uh, Haas's Tunica Dictionary along with the work that Gadget and Swanton did um, as well as uh, new words that are created by the community to deal with new concepts. Uh, similarly, we worked from the Tunica Grammar that Haas wrote uh, to form the basis of the Tunica textbook, which we use to uh, teach Tunica and will hopefully allow members of the community to learn Tunica even on their own. Uh, and again, the children's book didn't come from nowhere. We didn't make up stories that seemed, you know, Tunica-ish. They come from the Tunica text that Haas wrote uh, that Sasso Street told to Haas. It came from the stories that Sasso Street told to Haas. Uh, and we basically worked with that text um, and community member illustrated it 
um, and that's where we get the children's book from. So it's important to note that all of the new resources that Kylie creates have their bases in uh, existing documentation. So here's just some examples. You can see on the, the left is the uh, newer document and on the right is the older document. And you can see there's a lot of similarities uh, between them. Um, so you have webinary uh, based on the Tunica dictionary. Uh, here we have just a section of the Tunica grammar, which is very densely populated with linguistic jargon. Um, and then a much more accessible uh, bit of vocabulary and dialogue to help students learn. And then here, for instance, is the why the Tunica and the Biloxi became friends uh, from the Tunica texts that Haas wrote down from Sosostri. Um, and on the left, you have the uh, the way that we've adapted that with illustrations. Um, this is just a layout. So we have all these documents and we have our modern um, sources that we use. How do we get from those documents to what we have now? Uh, how do we answer questions that we have about Tunica, such as, what if we wanted to know, you know, what is the Tunica word for blue? So this is just a very simplified version of the process that we typically go through to answer these questions. And if you're familiar with the scientific method, this also might look familiar to you. Um, it's important to note this is not a one-time process. In fact, we are constantly going through it. So the first thing that we would do, we would start with our research question. For example, what's the Tunica word for blue? From there, we would go and find evidence. Um, we would look into those documentation or other sources. But we can't just stop there. There's usually quite a bit of linguistic analysis that we have to apply to figure out the answer to our question. And finally, we always bring our findings and we discuss them as a group. So it's not just one person making decisions. So like I said, uh, when we find evidence and we're, for we're fortunate to have lots of documentation, but that's only the beginning. And usually when we go and we find evidence, uh, we're usually left with more questions than we are answers. And in order to sort of figure out what the evidence means, we have to do some linguistic analysis. So there's a couple of ways that we go about doing linguistic analysis. And one thing is that we try to find internal patterns. So we have all these documents here. Um, one thing I'd like to highlight is the software FLEX, which stands for Fieldworks Language Explorer. Uh, this is a really powerful tool that we use uh, to help keep a database of everything that we've found so far. And it also it does some of the work for us and that it helps us to analyze and kind of uh, find patterns that we might not have seen uh, on our own just looking through the, the documents ourselves. We're currently using this, uh, using Flex to digitize some of the handwritten documents like the notebooks and that it's going to make it a lot easier to go through them. Um, another area that we look at is in nature. So our question was, what's the Tunica word for blue? Well, we know that the word Oshta um, shows up in the word for the blue racer snake and also in the name for the little blue heron. And those are both pretty, as you can see, pretty strikingly blue animals. Um, so this is further evidence from outside the language itself that the word for blue is in fact Oshta. And finally, you know, we never come to decisions on our own as researchers. We would always bring it up to the Tunica Language Working Group or the or Kylie, uh, as we know it in Tunica. Um, what we do, we try to communicate with each other. We 
weigh a lot of different considerations, like what kinds of decisions we've made before, what we've been teaching in classes, um, any other evidence that we might need to take into account. Like I said, the process is ongoing. Uh, we go through it multiple times. And sometimes we can come to a pretty fairly quick and easy agreement. Like, what do you think? Uh, the word for blue is Ashta, done. Uh, but usually there is a lot of debate. There's a lot of compromise and further research that we have to do. Um, in the end, we always try to collectively agree so that we can move forward with things like the, t the dictionary and the classes and the textbook. Uh, but we are always open to changing in light of better evidence. So we're constantly working to improve our understanding of Tunica. to unmute. Um, so what if we take all those steps that Tyler mentioned and we still don't have an answer? Um, at that point, it might be time to create a new word. If we don't have something that we can find in the dictionary or find in the text, then um, we might need to turn to a neologism. So we still need some knowledge from the original sources for this, but like I said, you're not going to actually find it directly in the text. Um, like we were able to with Ashta. Instead, you're going to use your knowledge of how words are formed in Tunica, so what we already know about how we make words, uh, our knowledge of the way Tunica sounds go together, and then our knowledge of existing Tunica words that might be relevant in order to create the new word. So let's say you want to talk about your summer vacation with your friend in Tunica, so you need the word swimmer. Um, you try to look it up in the webinary, or maybe you go all the way back to the uh, dictionary, um, and you still don't find it. So, well, you already know from other Tunica words uh, that uh, mean someone who does something, that you can use this little word piece, ta, um, onto the front of an action word in order to make it mean someone who does that action. So this is actually kind of like that ER we have in English in like swimmer or runner. That's someone who swims or someone who runs, right? Well, this ta does the same thing. All right, so you found out how to make it someone who does that action. Now you just need to find the word for that action. Uh, so you go to the Tunica webinary and you find that the word for to swim is woe you. Uh, from there, all you need to do is put it together. Uh, and now you have a brand new word, ta wo you, meaning one who swims or swimmer. Um, it's a little more complicated than that, of course, for other words and um, uh, even just other verbs. But for swimmer, this works great. Um, uh, so actually, uh, I know like with everything Tyler said and what I've just hinted at with the neologism, it all sounds pretty complicated. And there was a lot of work getting to the point where we would be able to, uh, s like, uh, do these processes quickly or on the fly, or even just as a group, just taking that knowledge, uh, from the text and moving it into more accessible materials. But thanks to those more accessible materials, like the webinary or the upcoming textbook, uh, anyone can create new words in Tunica. So here is a picture from one of our workshops, um, one of the youth immersion workshops. Uh, and part of it was a chance for students and teachers to work together uh, to come up with new words um, that weren't already in the language. So for example, uh, one year we had a summer camp about birds and shockingly, uh, so Sostri was not talking about penguins a lot in the Tunica text that didn't come up a lot. So we didn't have uh, a word for penguin and uh, that that theme was birds that year um, or um, emu or something like that. Uh, so students sat down with dictionaries and with some teachers and they worked together to create suggestions for words and then everyone voted on them. There's a little more involved in the process, but the kids would just like a little over an hour, we're able to sit down and actually come up with suggestions and ideas. Uh, so you might be hearing all this and uh, feeling a little uncomfortable about the idea of having to make up words for a language, but language variation and neologism are something that happens all the time in every single language. So, so long as a language is being used, new words are going to be added because there's new contexts you'll be speaking about. Um, 
Yeah. So in English, we have words like Google and I've written cellular phone like I'm a thousand years old, but <laughs> I suppose that was the original one. And then that, then we shortened it to cell phone. They both were being, uh, they're both existing words, right, that got put together or changed a little bit in order to describe new contexts. And the same thing has undoubtedly happened throughout the existence of tunica. But the easiest type of new word to trace is what's called a loan word, which is a word borrowed from one language into another. You're probably familiar with a lot of these. There's a lot for dishes, like in English, enchilada, tortilla, taco are all borrowed from, as you could probably guess, Spanish to describe a certain dish. But there are also um, less obvious ones, like uh, the English word government is from the French word gouvernement. But I think that if you sat down um, with English now, you wouldn't like look at the word government and be like, oh yeah, they, they took that from the French. It's part of the language so much so that I don't think people think about it at all when they say the word. Um, Tunica also has words like this, um, which we can even see being used by Sesostri in the text themselves. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's been a lot of COVID words. Um, yeah, already some in the text themselves. So words like samedi, meaning Saturday from the French samedi. Um, or there's actually a bunch also borrowed from um, related, uh, or just not related, sorry, um, other Native American languages that would have been spoken in the area. So you can find the Choctaw word Tula, meaning fox, in the Tunica word Tula Hipu, meaning fox dance. Um, so all of this is to say, not only are neologisms a natural part of all languages, they're actually a sign that the language is healthy, growing and being used in many contexts. Because if you aren't having to uh, talk about new contexts, then you're not needing new words. But if you're getting into a situation where you're going to use tunica, for example, to talk about that penguin you saw at the zoo with your friend, or to, I guess, uh, talk about what you're doing in your online school, then you're going to need neologisms. So not only is it not something that's a negative sign, uh, creating these words and the fact that um, everyone can do this is a sign that it's all going quite well. All right, so now that we've had this discussion of how we got from the original source material like uh, Sisostri's uh, text to something everyone can learn like the textbook or the webinary, all the way to something that everyone can use and contribute to in a variety of ways like we've seen with the neologisms and answering the questions like, um, how do we say blue? Uh, Elizabeth is going to tell us some specific ways you can get involved uh, with the language and with the LCRP. Here we go. Okay, so how, how can you get involved? Um, well, you can uh, participate in our programming and we have weekly classes. Our programming definitely has changed um, since the pandemic, but we still are um, having weekly language classes and we have classes for five to 10 year olds, 11 to 16 year olds and 17 plus. Um, and I know that some of our, our, our students um, have joined us this evening. Um, we're glad to see y'all. Um, if you signed up for classes, um, but haven't been able to make any, we do offer um, we make the class recordings available online or on the tribal website. Um, and it, that's open for anyone to view. So, um, you know, if you are just curious, you know, if, if you just like to check a class out um, on your time, you're welcome to view those as well. Um, we have cultural events. Um, we've been having uh, craft circles and we're gonna be hosting craft circles monthly. Um, we've also um, had our annual basketry summit. Even um, after the pandemic this past October, we had our basketry summit online. Um, and craft circles, basketry summits, cultural events, those are open to all ages and most of the time open to the public as well. Um, <laughs> If, um, if you want uh, to get more involved, you know, with more of the behind the scenes work, um, you're welcome to attend our meetings, our Kyrie meetings, um, get in touch with us, um, you know, um, you know, 
to get the information how how to join those meetings, um, who to contact. Um, you can also um, you know view a conference presentation. Um, nowadays, um, conferences um, we aren't coming together in person. We are joining um, conferences online, so conference presentations are even uh, available online um, through, you know, the, the organization's website or YouTube. Um, so just, you know, uh, send us an email, send us a message, um, see, you know, if, if there have any, have been any conferences that happened in the past or, or if there's any that are coming up, you know, we're always willing to share that information with you. Um, you can also volunteer during our events or assist with prep for LCRP programming, even online, I'm sure there's something, um, you know, that you can help with, or um, maybe, you know, you're interested in um, teaching yourself one day, who knows? <laughs> um, we're open open to any, any uh, anyone willing to volunteer. Um, but if you're not wanting to get involved um, on, on those levels, you can, um, you know, study tunica on your own um, or follow, you know, uh, what we have um, available online through Instagram or Facebook. Um, tunica Language Forum is also a good place uh, to join that's on, on Facebook. Um, if you have any questions or, you know, um, if you want access to materials in order to study tunic on your own. You can always post your questions in there and um, we can get the information to you. If you have any questions regarding translations, you know, we're always willing to do that as well. Um, I guess my, my question, you know, to those that are viewing and, and to those that have joined this evening, what other platforms would you use to share content that you've created or what other pl platforms would you like us to share to? Um, I've had some ideas for TikTok. I've seen, you know, people do duets, um, especially for language learning. I, I think that's that's uh, pretty cool. I've heard, you know, people have some ideas for Minecraft. Um, so, what what other platforms are you interested in? What types of content would you like to see in the future? Um, <clears throat> and so, um, I'd I'd like to leave you with a challenge, um, my first challenge um, is uh, for, you know, everyone that's here um, or everyone that's viewing this evening, learn a new word or phrase in Tunica. Um, you can even, if you'd like, you can start a Tunica hashtag, you can create your own meme, um, and of course share, whatever you've created, share, um, and be sure to uh, tag LCRP uh, social media platforms. Um, we'd also like you to complete um, a survey. I've provided the link in um, the chat on Facebook um, for this video um, for, for this event. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, Meg has an idea um, that she can share as well. Um, I'm going to be posting for for everyone that's attended um, this evening. I'm going to post the link in the chat. So um, this is one way for you to um, voice your opinion, um, share <laughs> share with us. Uh, you know, your, your thoughts um, and your experience at tonight's event. Um, let's see, we, we can, <laughs> we can, we can, we're, we're going to um, move on. Let's see, we're going to have a Q&A session. So um, if you're watching on Facebook, uh, you know, don't be shy, send in your, 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 your thoughts, your questions. Um, and we're gonna open the floor to some of our attendees this evening. Um, <laughs> let's see, we also have door prizes. So for those of you that had have uh, registered and have attended tonight's 
um, meeting. Um, you're 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 pretty lucky. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'll I'll, I'll pass it on to uh, let's see, Meg. Would you? Will you? Um, let's see. So we don't have a lot of time left. Um, so I think I might suggest um, we we go ahead and uh, open the floor to questions, and then at um, five. Uh, Oh gosh, like 527. So in 10 minutes, uh, I'm going to pass it over to Miss Donna because she has a closing song to do. Um, but I want to go ahead and uh, open the floor to questions. These can be about anything because like we said, the purpose of this was y'all have opportunities to like go to the classes um, and learn, but we don't often get a chance to talk to everybody about where that information that you're learning comes from and what the process is. And to make it clear, y'all can get involved at any of these levels that you're interested in. I know everybody has um, time limits and energy limits, so we certainly wouldn't ask y'all to do more than you're prepared to. But if anything tonight, whether it's even just, hey, I'd like to uh, post something every once in a while on the language forum or when things are back in person, if you if you want to like cook at part of an event, any of that would be absolutely wonderful um, and we'd love for y'all to join. Uh, so you can either unmute yourself and ask a question or you can type it in the chat. Um, and we will we will need to announce the winners as well. Uh, uh, but yeah, you can type in the chat or you can unmute yourself. Uh, if nobody says something, uh, I have a few, but I'd like to hear from everyone else first. Let's see. Um, Oh, yes, Raquel. Raquel, can you speak up a little bit? I'm having a hard time hearing you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I was saying that um, I uh, I teach preschool, mostly elementary school, um, and I'll be having my first child soon. Um, and I have been making uh, flashcards as like you would teach a child English. Um, right now they're just very basic, but they have the English word the tunica word and a picture and you could buy these you know anywhere in english but if that was to be made available um i would certainly purchase something like that um but i was just giving that idea out there i know it's it, it is sort of um there um through workbooks and things like that um but i would definitely like to see that um as well as like a uh cooking channel or you know we've seen um, basket weaving and beading. Um, some of the elders have done that uh, by themselves. Um, I've seen uh, another tribe that does native dance. Uh, it's totally completely separate from our tribe, but I've been watching her. She uses it more as a workout, but I love watching it um, so that we could learn um, the different types of dances um, and what the regalia means because there is the different type. Um, so that would be awesome um, to see those in the in either workshops or on the Facebook pages that we have created already. So for other ideas, just to keep things going. Those are all excellent ideas. I think I've heard uh, some discussion at the very least of the um, of the cooking uh, classes before. I want to toss the specifics of that over to um, Elizabeth and Donna, because I think y'all have mentioned something about that before. I just wanted to say it sounded cool. Yes, um, so we, we have had, um, we currently have craft circles um, 
and we have had uh, powwow dance classes in person in, in Marksville um, in the past. Um, and you know, as as things are 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 picking up, um, you know, as we're we're um, moving, <laughs> I guess, um, you know, moving on uh, throughout the pandemic, we are are you know slowly increasing our our, our programming. Um, so so those those are definitely great ideas. Um, you know, those are. When when we um, get to planning our programming, those are definitely you know things we should keep in mind. Um, whenever we're we're uh, you know scheduling new events and and, and programs. Oh, we have uh, the education department has has uh, done some uh, uh, Zoom uh, cooking uh, classes. Uh, We've outsourced, of course, uh, this with a, a company out of New Orleans, but we've learned a lot from watching how they do it. So uh, uh, the idea of, uh, I'm sure we could recreate it. We, we've recently in the last year or so have been able to purchase some good um, hardware of cameras and so forth. and. Uh, uh, now that they have the, the council chamber, they, uh, not the, uh, the uh, general council meeting room over here, they've also have added a bunch of uh, equipment in there as well. So um, we have, it's just about getting people back into the office and so we can do these things, you know, because we're very limited right now with uh, any in-person stuff, even among staff, uh, we're having to keep our distance and, you know, so, uh, but uh, no, these are great ideas, Ra Raquel, and uh, um, some things that we've tried in the past that we can resurrect, and, you know, that maybe we did uh, um, uh, in person that we can try to modify and make it a virtual uh, uh, event as well. So, you know, we have to, you know, we're thinking about things ahead and how we can adapt things. So that's a I appreciate the, the feedback there. And if any of y'all are hearing this and you're thinking, well, I feel confident about my ability to dance or my ability to cook, but I feel stressed about the language, contact us and we can work together and complement each other's strengths. <laughs> um, but thank you. That was really great. Uh, does anyone else have something? It could be suggestions, questions. Uh, yes, Dave. Sorry, I can't Hi. point, can I? Hi. Hey, how to Saku Ilianiku, Dave Prine Atisa. I'm working with a uh, tribe in Oregon who uh, has a similar thing. We're doing archive-based revitalization and trying to assemble the language. And due to the grant structure, we kind of have to put materials out before we can really look at the language as a whole. And I'm just curious, what is your uh, damage control like if you put something out there and then realize, oh, well, this form is incorrect or, or it actually takes a different ending in this context. And then you have to kind of change things. Uh, obviously you, you would have to reprint textbooks or, or something like that. But I'm just curious how much is let's get something out there sooner and then fix it as we go versus let's keep everything kind of, you know, until it's officially official. Uh, so I'm just curious what the process is like for that when you learn as you go. Well, I want to open the floor to Raina and Patricia if they would like to add something here and Kuakera. Um, I suppose anyone, anyway. but uh, I think a, a factor here, some of this we're going to learn a little more about, right, as we're um, actually like publishing something that's a little more set in stone than, you know, we can adapt in a classroom. Uh, but does anyone have any particular thoughts on, on that? I'd like to chime in. Yeah. So, Henny uh, Hotu, Raina Atisa. Um, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Oklahoma, and I've been with the project for, oh man, yeah, a long time. Um, <laughs> just chipping in when I can. So, uh, I heard Daryl Baldwin talk about this once, and for anybody who knows Daryl Baldwin, he's an indigenous language activist. He runs the Miami Center um, at the University of Miami in Ohio, and he brought up his kids in the language and you know sort of taught it to himself. And uh, when he was asked about this, he basically said that you know it's always a learning process. You're never done. <laughs> You're always finding things that are different. You know, when you finally make it to working with the stuff from the 1800s after you work through the 1900s and uh, that it's just a constant process. And when you find something new, you have to adapt, you know? Um, 
you know, printing costs aside, that's sort of what you do. You just learn a new thing and you incorporate it because that's how human brains work, like with neologisms, like Meg was just talking about. You got you. I'd also like to say also that one of the things you can do is you can make, especially when the changes are, or when the differences are minor, um, you can make both be acceptable. Um, I know in Tunica, a lot of, of the, the things that we've sort of, I guess, struggled with is which, which version do we teach? But it's very possible that a lot of these things, you know, sounds dropping out, things like that, were a common feature of, of you know, just conversational speech. Um, so if it's a small thing like that that could be explained by phonology, um, then one of the things you can do is, is just make both the fuller form and the, the elided form both acceptable. Uh, and I just want to say that's part of why I'd love to have more workshop check-ins like this, because um, if we're going to have to be adapting, uh, we want to make sure everyone knows why we have to adapt and has confidence in where uh, this information is coming from and what the process is. Uh, so while as everyone said, um, like it's always going to be a learning process, we want to make sure that um, it's not a passive one where the students in the classroom are just expected to uh, take us at our word, but one also where we let them know why, why did this change or um, uh, things like, uh, why did we say this in the first place? I think, um, of course, no one has the time to sit down and, and have each check run by them, but uh, doing more general talks like this, I think are a nice opportunity. Um, does anyone have anything else? Uh, I just, I think we have time for one more question and, and that's it. Looking at all these tiny screens, it looks like everybody uh, is good. Well, Tikash Hotu, thank you so much um, for coming and uh, listening to this. Uh, and I really appreciated the questions and suggestions. Um, and now I believe Miss Donna uh, has a song. Donna, you're muted. Many things to say, but I try not to say everything. Um, I said that we have traditional songs, but we have songs, popular songs that we've translated into Tunica, or songs that we've taken the melody of traditional songs to uh, serve a purpose. So we have a farewell song. And the farewell song we use from Uwa, Itashi. Then we use from the, the future aspect ending, the Kacha, Itashi Kacha. We use Latilapu, good evening, Lawulapu, good night. And we'd sing it to the tune of Good Night, Ladies. So, Poitin, uh, Yuentake. La ti la pu, la ti la pu, la ti la pu, itashi kacha. La wu la pu, la wu la pu, la wu la pu, itashi kacha. O tu ti, ti kacha. Can I announce the door prize winners? Oh, please. Okay, uh, we have uh, Rebecca. Dave, Judy, and Raquel. So uh, uh, if uh, uh, you could email or Jessica will probably email you and you can let her know what shirt si size you wear. And you will be receiving uh, uh, our travel history book that we published back in 2017 uh, and a t-shirt that we had printed for our 25th annual powwow that we did not have in 2020. So it is a collector's item, very rare, uh, and I hope you enjoy it. So uh, I want to say thank you to Koch, to all of you for participating this evening. Uh, I hope this is the first of many conversations. I appreciate uh, our team putting together some of the uh, background information and 
um, you know, we, we live and breathe this, you know, every day, every week. And it's good just to be able to talk about this and hopefully we get more people involved and, uh, and, and, you know, get them interested. Maybe, maybe they don't really understand the whole thing about uh, the tunica language. And there's a lot of people like that in our community, but, uh, but having uh, linguists and friends from outside our community uh, talk with us about this and uh, it, it will build understanding and hopefully more support as we move forward. So tikach, latte lapu. Apoinan, apoitin, hita. Lau lapu hutu. Hita, tikach. Hita, hita. Lau lapu. Lau lapu. Tikach. Tikach. Like shepa.